Today we will be looking at some of the most disturbing interviews ever recorded with people that have done horrific things and show no remorse. From an interview with a child who has tried a number of times to kill her family, to an interview with famous serial killers. I'll be discussing these and more only on today's top 10 list. Starting off this countdown we have Eileen Wernos. Eileen Wernos is often considered the first female serial killer. She was found guilty of killing seven men. She would murder them, rob them, and then drive home in their cars. Although she claims every murder was self-defense. In our interview, we can see how lax she is when talking about killing. Just, just shot in self-defense. Boom, boom, boom. You know, they weren't cut up. They weren't sliced up. No OJ jazz. You know, and he said I did the most horrendous crime in the whole wide world. Death and murder literally doesn't phase her at all. In fact, she claims that what she did wasn't even bad. Yeah, she tries to justify her actions by saying she just shot them, as if that's not a big deal. But you've been convicted of killing seven men. Everybody's looking at the number. Does that not, you, you killed well, seven men, seven strangers. Does that not make you a serial killer? So I didn't kill them every day, did I? Again, she's acting like her killing seven men isn't a big deal. Like, oh, it's just seven men. People have done worse. It's crazy. Moving on to number nine, we have the Night Stalker. Richard Ramirez, otherwise known as the Night Stalker, was an American serial killer and robber who killed 13 to 16 plus individuals. At his trials, the judge stated that he never showed any remorse for these doings. I think the creepiest part about his interview is when he admits to being evil. Do you admit to being evil, Richard? We are all evil in some form or another, are we not? Yes, I am evil. Not 100%, but I am evil. And we see him try to justify his killings by saying the government does worse things to people than what he has done. Serial killers do on a small scale what governments do on a large one. They are a product of the times, and these are bloodthirsty times. Even psychopaths have emotions if you dig deep enough, but then again, maybe they don't. In our it spot, we have Edward Edwards. Edward Wayne Edwards, otherwise known as the Hook Man or the Man with the Hook, was an American con artist turned serial killer. In fact, when he committed his long list of crimes, he never wore a mask because he wanted to be famous. In 2010, he did an interview and confessed to all his crimes. Again, it makes me so uncomfortable listening to how killers took someone's life. He's taking his hand, he's going through the bottom of the duffel bag trying to find the cigarettes. And I'm standing right here, uh, and I have the sawed-off shotgun, and I ease it out of the bag while Danny's down there looking, and I... He's just too calm talking about all of this. During the interview, he also stated that he wanted the death penalty and thinks that he deserves it. I want the death penalty. You don't want to be in prison for a long time on, on everything else that's been going on. Right, I got all, I'm, I'm, I'm not a healthy man. In our seventh spot, we have Paris Bennett. During an interview with Piers Morgan, Paris Bennett, who at 13 years of age, killed his young sister, admits that he did this as a way to punish his mother. Specifically in the end, yes. to cause your mother maximum pain. This has achieved your goal, which was to effectively mean your mother lost both her children at once. In 2007, Bennett convinced their babysitter to leave early and then proceeded to stab his sister 17 times. It's such a tragic case. What makes it worse is how he pretends to say he loved his sister. In the interview, he was asked to describe why he loved his sister and he couldn't. Because I loved her. I loved her with every fiber of my being. They say it's like asking a colorblind person to describe the color red. They can't do it. He can't describe love because he can't feel it. Exactly like she said, it's because Paris is incapable of feeling emotions. No guilt, no love, nothing. Moving on to number six, we have Angela Simpson. Right. You, you murdered this man. Yes. You tortured him. Of course. This is an interview with killer Angela Simpson. She was arrested after torturing and killing a man in a wheelchair for snitching. During this interview, she tells exactly what happened how she did it, and why. The scariest part is how forward she is about this all. She doesn't care that she's going to prison or that she killed someone. Uh, you're not here to pretend to be remorseful. Of course not, why would I do that? 
Are you remorseful? Not at all. She's not remorseful at all, and she's very open about everything. To my house, walked him down the street. I don't know why the media acts like the mother couldn't walk. He walked very well. Walked him upstairs, kicked his ass. Like imagine being okay with taking someone's life. This interview sends shivers down my spine just listening to her and watching the stillness in her body and the calmness in her voice. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with Manuel Vela. In 2016, a 28 year old man, Manuel Vela, was arrested after killing his girlfriend and their unborn baby. In this interview, you can tell that Manuel suffered from schizophrenia. He claims that the father told him to kill his girlfriend and her baby. Keep in mind, he is the father to her baby. And then he says that he is the antichrist. And that's where I cut her open, when he told me to. When who told you to? Uh, the father, it's just the same one who was to communicate with uh, Jesus Christ is when he was here. Although it seems like he is intoxicated during this interview, he is not. He's just experiencing hallucinations and delusions. In this interview, he also claims he would receive commands from outer space and extraterrestrials. A lot of people found this interview disturbing just because you can see how far gone Manuel is. He's no longer in control of himself. In our fourth spot, we have Arthur Shawcross. Arthur John Shawcross was an American serial killer in Rochester, New York that took the lives of 13 individuals. His first two murders were committed in 1972. He was caught for both and then sentenced to 25 years. But after serving 15 years, he was released on parole. That's when he continued on with the killings and took the lives of 11 different people. His interview is creepy for a number of reasons. Do you remember killing her? Yeah, possibly. He gives me the chills. He's just twitching and his voice is just so unnerving. But it gets worse once he starts talking about his crimes. How did you kill her? Probably strangulation. How do you know when they're dead? How? I don't know, just do. You can see that he won't admit it directly. He says maybe he killed her and maybe she died by strangulation. It gets worse. I reach over my shoulder like this, right behind my neck, and I pull out a brand new machete. When she backed out, I come up behind her. He's just a ruthless killer. In our third spot, we have Ted Bundy. Ted Bundy was an infamous serial killer who was responsible for murdering 30 women. Although it's thought that this number may be even higher. He would often kill these women in brutal ways. In his interviews, he shows no remorse for his actions, and the calm tone of his voice is very disturbing. I can see how certain feelings and ideas developed in me to the point where I began to act out on them. Certain very violent and very destructive feelings. Throughout this whole interview, Bundy tries to gain sympathy from the interviewer and the audience. You can see how he's trying to manipulate your emotions, which is terrifying. A lot of people commented saying that Bundy is trying to act human in these interviews. He knows exactly what to say and how to say it to manipulate you. It, it was like something had say snapped, that I knew that, uh, that I couldn't control it anymore, that these barriers that, that I had, had, been, uh, I had learned as a child uh, that had been instilled in me were not enough to hold me back with respect to seeking out and, and harming somebody. It's a huge reason why he was so famous and had a huge media following. Moving on to number two, we have Beth Thomas. Beth Thomas was a young girl featured in a documentary titled The Child of Rage. At such a young age, Beth displayed psychopathic tendencies, including harming her brother on a number of occasions and trying to kill her parents. Her parents were terrified of her and her brother Jonathan's safety, as they should be. Take a look at our interview. This is your brother. Why is your brother afraid of you? Because I hurt him so much. Mm-hmm. Okay. And what at nighttime, what do your parents do to your door? Lock it shut. Mm, why do they lock it shut? Because they don't want me to hurt John. So on a number of occasions, Beth would go into her brother's room at night to try and kill him. On top of that, she used to steal knives from the kitchen to try and harm her family with. Big sharp ones. And what do you want to do with those knives? 
until John and Mommy went from and Daddy. That's not all. Here is her recounting the time she hurt Jonathan. And what happened to your brother? Tell me about it. His head hurt real bad. But his chin, he had to have stitches in it. Now apparently doctors deemed that she acted this way as part of her traumatic past. Now it's said that after years of therapy, she is now a healthy adult. And in our number one spot, we have Jeffrey Dahmer. I desensitize myself to it. I, 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 uh... I don't know, I went to great lengths. Between 1878 to 1991, American serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer murdered and dismembered 17 men and boys. He would pack the victim's body parts into plastic bags and bury them behind his parents' home. He would also take disturbing photographs of his deceased victims and keep certain body parts as souvenirs. He also had tendencies to eat the victims. This gave him the name the Milwaukee Cannibal or the Milwaukee Monster. Upon searching his home, police found albums full of pictures of body parts, and his place was filled with human remains. Before his death, Jeffrey had an interview with Inside Edition and other news channels. In these interviews, he shares gory details about the men he killed and why he did it. One time I brought this uh, young man back to the hotel room, the Ambassador Hotel. Uh, was just planning on drugging him and uh, spending the night with him I had no intention of hurting him what's creepy is how calm he is talking about all this like he's murdered so many people and shows no remorse just like all the other serial killers on this list i was uh, handcuffed and uh it it was just the realization that there was no point in trying to hide hide uh, my actions anymore. Hearing him say that he kept the dead with him as long as possible makes me sick. When police raided his house, they found heads were in the fridge and freezer. Two skulls were on display in the house, and they found a 57 gallon drum filled with decomposing bodies in his room. Starting off this countdown, we have Stephen McDaniel. Yeah, Lauren was my neighbor. Um, we're just trying to find out where she is at this point. I mean, no one has seen her since Saturday. I mean, the last time anyone heard from her was an email that she sent out, and I mean, no one's heard from her since. In June of 2011, Stephen McDaniel killed his neighbor and classmate, Lauren Giddings. Apparently, he had a fantasy of committing the perfect murder, but this murder was anything but perfect, and he got caught pretty soon. So the day her body was found, Stephen actually was interviewed by a news station. Throughout his whole interview, he tries to act concerned and shocked by her disappearance. Do you know anybody that, any enemies she might have had, somebody that might want to hurt her? No, I mean, we're, we don't know where she is. I mean, the only thing we can think is that maybe she went out running and someone snatched her. He also tries to make it seem like she got killed after going out for a run. But throughout the interview, he makes it clear that he knew far more about Lauren than he had let on. At one point, the interview informs him that her body was found. And you could see the moment that he realized he was screwed. We just don't know where she is. What about um, in the like the parking lot area? I know they've been doing a lot of, I think that's where they have recovered the body or whatever they recovered from there. Body? Um, had you heard, any, had you seen anything there? Had you seen anything there? I, I mean, we don't know if this is the same person. You know what I mean? Like, they took out a body there earlier. We don't know if it's the same person or not. So that's how we're trying to ask people if they know who lived there. Are you okay, sir? After taking a second to regroup himself, he continues on with the interview. But you can tell he knows he's been caught. I don't know anyone that would want to hurt her. She was as nice a person as there is. In 2014, McDaniel pleaded guilty to the murder. And if you guys are liking this video so far, then make sure to give it a big thumbs up. Also, make sure to check out part one to this video. Coming in at number nine, we have Wayne. With a psychopath, I would argue that emotion is like being colorblind for them. And nothing we can do is actually going to instill a sense of empathy. This is really a waste of time. 
This man, only referred to as Wayne, was the subject of the 2000 Channel 4 documentary titled Psychopath. Now I couldn't find much about him besides what the documentary said, but apparently Wayne stabbed and killed someone that pissed him off. That still hasn't been verified, but that's what the rumors are. But what's startling is how he got an extremely rare score of 40 out of 40 on the psychopathy checklist. Like this dude is on another level. The therapists are wonderful. I learn a great deal from them. Uh, sometimes it can be hard. I suppose that's the way it's supposed to be when you're growing up. Uh, I'm ready to go now. I know that that decision will come from others who have already seen. They seen my change. It's creepy how he's trying to convince the therapist that he's fine and should be let out. In our eighth spot, we have the grave robber. Now, I for sure have talked about this video before, but it definitely deserves a spot on this list. This interview is with an unidentified teen from the 90s. In the video, he talks all about how he robs graves and then proceeds to tell us how to do it and how to do it so you don't get caught and what to do afterwards with the body parts. Now, so what you do is you grab it around here. You grab it here and peel it back like that, okay? Peel it back, all right, and it'll pull off. It'll make a disgusting sound. Throughout this whole video, he's holding a real life skull that he robbed from someone's grave. Now, what's creepy about this video is that no one knows who this guy is. Rumor has it that the video surfaced on the dark web and later got leaked and then uploaded to YouTube, but we don't know for sure. Like, just look at how creepy this is. Right, this is a piece of the brains. Let's see. Right, this is another piece of the brains. If I had something wet here, I would wet them up and let you see how the brains look. It's honestly very unsettling. And he also gives us tips for how not to get caught. Never leave witnesses. If you have to knock them out, knock them out so that way they think it's a dream. It's best not to kill but if it's necessary do it like who is this video for and why did he make it moving on to number seven we have edmund kemper ed kemper also known as big ed is an american serial killer who killed 10 individuals it all started back in 1964 when ed killed his grandparents at the age of 15. he claimed that he killed them just to see what it felt like I'm saying i'd wanted to kill my mother since i was eight years old and i'm not proud of that it started with surrogates at, at a non-human level. Physical objects, mm -hmm. my possessions, other people's, destruction of things that are cared about. And then destruction of things that are living on a lower level, small animals, uh, insects, animals, and then finally people. As he said in this interview, he literally had an urge to kill since he was young. After the death of his grandparents, he was locked away for five years. Then in 1969, he was released at the age of 21. But he didn't learn his lesson because he went on to murder eight more individuals, one of them being his own mother. Eventually, he was convicted again. Here we have him talking about his first murder, his grandparents. It started coming to a head again, so I went back down. I ran away back down there. And then a month later, I'm up living with my grandparents in the mountains, and 10 months later, I murdered them. It made it worse to be on top of a mountain. I was literally on top of a mountain when it happened. And I could sense, I sensed everybody in the world just stopping what they were doing, turning around, saw what I did, and are coming to get me. And I knew I was paranoid at that moment. I knew anybody that came up there and gave me a funny look or a fishy eye or quizzical look, I'd have blown their brains out thinking they were coming to get me. In our sixth spot, we have Kevin Davis. This interview is very disturbing to watch, so be warned. On March 27, 2010, Kevin Davis killed his mother, Kimberly Hill. That morning, he asked his mom if he could take his own life, and Kimberly basically kind of just dismissed him. And that was not the answer he was hoping for. I guess he wanted his mother to, like, fight for him to live. So he ended up killing his mother instead. In this interview, he calmly tells exactly what he did to his mom. Every last detail. I tried to strangle her with a cord ripped the cord from a video game console controller. That didn't work. She was sitting on the couch lying to me. Okay. That didn't work out too well. She started screaming, and so I went to her room, opened a drawer at the very bottom to the right, I pulled out a hammer. Then you can guess what he did with that hammer. But it doesn't stop there. Okay, that's when you reached in and grabbed the brain? Yeah, I kicked at it a bit. Then I just, uh, that was kind of silly, but. And the eye just decided to reach in and kind of just... That is 
horrifying. But that's not all he did to his poor mother, but it's far too disturbing to talk about this case any further. We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with Liam McCatsney. On December 2nd, 2016, Sarah Stern went missing. Who's to blame for this? Her friends, Liam McCatsney and Preston Taylor. Basically, Liam had learned that Sarah had been left a large sum of money from her mother when she passed away. She told Liam about this and Liam and Preston made a plan to kill her and then steal the money. But they were caught after a former friend secretly videotaped Liam's confession. Yeah, and dude. Alright, so, I'm hanging out with her. She has, we, we went to the bank, she took some money out, not all of her money. We're counting it out, and then she goes to walk out the front door. I choke her out, drag her. My biggest problem was the dog. So Liam had went to Sarah's house, strangled her, and then stole $9,000. Less than he thought there was, but that was because Sarah spent a lot of the money already. The saddest part is during the taping when he said exactly how he killed her. It took me a half an hour to kill her. I thought I was going to be able to choke her out and have her out in like a couple minutes. After that, the two threw her body over a bridge. It's so disturbing. Like Sarah thought that she could trust Liam. She never thought that he would take her life. Coming in at number four, we have John Wayne Gacy. Chances are you've heard of him. He was an American serial killer often called the Killer Clown. He got his name since he would dress up as Pogo the Clown for neighborhood events or children's parties. Over several years, Gacy murdered 33 people. In 1978, Gacy was finally caught. The interview you are about to see was the first time he ever did an interview about the case. It was filmed while he was on death row. And he did it to try and get people to see that he was innocent. He's not innocent though. <laughs> people don't want to know the truth and the, and the honesty of it. If they want to be convinced or brainwashed into what they believe, then fine, then go ahead and kill me. But vengeance is mine, say it the Lord, because you will have executed somebody that didn't commit the crime. He thinks people were brainwashed into thinking he killed those people, even though all the evidence suggests that he did, like they were found all over his property. When they paint the image that I was this monster who, who picked up like these altar boys along the street and swatted them like flies, I said, this is ludicrous. The craziest part of the interview is that Gacy claims to have taken a high amount of truth serum and even then maintained his innocence. Taken th uh, five and a half hours, three and a half hours of truth serum. And under, under sodium amethyl, the maximum amount that I could have, it shows that I have no knowledge of the crime whatsoever. But there's absolutely no proof anywhere that he even took truth serum. So there you go. He's a creepy liar and killer. In our third spot, we have Michael Ross. Well, I'm a serial killer. I've killed eight women, six in this state, and two in New York. Michael Ross was an American serial killer that between 1981 to 1984 murdered eight women. What's creepy is how in his interview, he just calmly straight up admits that he's a serial killer, as if it's no big deal. He then proceeds to say that it's only eight women that he's killed. Other people have higher counts. It's as if he finds it okay because the number is small to him. I'm not a big serial killer, by the way. Eight, eight people, that's nothing. I mean, there's... There's a lot of other guys you can go see. Now, another part about this interview that creeps me out, much like the others on this list, is how he recounts the time he killed his victim. I saw this woman walking along the road with a uh, stroller. Uh, I pulled off the side of the road. Um, she came into the driveway, walked up the driveway. I was behind the house. Um, She saw me and I grabbed her. On July 6, 1987, he was sentenced to death. He spent 18 years on death row and then was executed in May of 2005. Moving on, number two, we have Gerard John Schaefer. Uh, Mr. Schaefer, how long have you been uh, imprisoned? Since 1973. And what are you accused of? Well, do you mean what am I convicted of or what am I accused of? I'm accused what? of a lot more than I'm convicted of. Mm. This guy is so arrogant, also very creepy. So Gerard Schaefer was a former sheriff's deputy that used his title to kill women. Now it's thought that he was a serial killer, but this has never been proved. But he was found guilty of murdering two women. First, what are you accused of? Well, I was accused of, originally, originally accused of killing 34 women, but nobody has ever managed to come up with 34 names. 
jurisdictions or anything else. It's a false accusation. So basically, on July 21st, 1973, Schaefer pulled over two girls who were hitchhiking, saying that it was illegal in the country, which it wasn't. He then drove them to a swamp area and tied them to a tree. But the girls were lucky. Schaefer was going to shoot them, but right before he was about to, he got a call on his police radio. So he went back to his car to check on it. And when he did, the girls managed to escape and report him. He was then arrested for unlawful imprisonment and aggravated assault. Two months after he posted bail, he abducted two more female hitchhikers, but this time he actually took their lives. And what is your conviction? I was convicted of killing two in Fort Pierce. I was never shown to be at the crime scene. There was never any link between me and the people that were killed, except the testimony of the mother of one of them. He's so creepy. Also, notice that he barely blinks. This guy just gives me the heebie-jeebies. In our number one spot, we have Issei Sagawa. This case is incredibly messed up and extremely dark. It literally made me feel sick to my stomach just researching about it. So Issei Sagawa is a Japanese man who in 1981 killed and ate a woman named Renee Hartvelt in Paris. But he was never truly convicted of his crimes. He literally only spent two days in jail and then was sent back to Japan. And when he was there, he became famous. So famous that he made a living through the public's interest in his crime. Imagine that, literally becoming wealthy for killing someone. I don't want to kill, but uh, uh, I, I couldn't find any way to eat the girl's meat fresh. So I thought I have to kill. So Sagawa apparently had a fantasy to eat beautiful women. He apparently chose Renee because she was beautiful and he wanted to absorb her energy. On June 11th, 1981, he invited Renee over and shot her at the back of the neck. He then ate her over the next two days. Starting off this countdown, we have Gary Ridgway. Gary Ridgway, otherwise known as the Green River Killer, took the lives of 48 women between 1980 to 1990. But it's believed that his number may be as high as 70 one people. He gets his name due to the fact that he would dump the bodies along riverbanks in South King County. In 2001, he was arrested. After his conviction, he did an interview where he talked all about his murders and how he had the desire to kill ever since he was little. But I took my aggression on. I couldn't take it on my mom. I had to take it on my animals and stated in the interview, he confessed that he started killing at a young age. He had this built up anger towards his mom, but he couldn't harm her, so he would harm animals instead. Living things? Living things, killing, killing animals. Okay. Killing animals. Um. In this interview, he went on to talk more about his victims in detail. Hearing someone confess to murder is just very, very disturbing. In our ninth spot, we have John Hughes. But before I go any further, make sure to hit that thumbs up button because it really helps us out. I don't think like normal people, never have. I have racing thoughts, it's been that way since I was a kid. I'm constantly, it doesn't matter if I'm asleep, if I'm awake, I'm constantly thinking of a hundred things at one time. John Hughes considers himself the Antichrist. He was arrested back in 2008 after killing a trucker at a rest stop along Interstate 29. This dude is intense and incredibly scary. He claims to have killed 15 to 20 people, but that hasn't been confirmed yet. Either way, in this interview for KMBC News, Lara Moretz gets the chance to interview him. And he talks about the people he has taken the lives of and why he did this. Rest area, and that was a way for me to gain control, to, to show, I don't know, I guess I would assert my dominance, I guess you could say. That'd be the way to put it. And it shut everybody up for a while. The scariest part of the interview is when Lara asks if he feels bad about killing people. And this was his response. I don't feel bad about killing uh, anyone. Not personally, but I've personally done myself, no. I just view things as objects, people, animals, the trees, cars, they're just all the same to me. So no, he feels no remorse. In our eighth spot, we have Jose Martinez. Explanation because I want to get them. I didn't want the cops to find them. I want to find them myself. We went to this little house. We broke in there and we find one, I shot him. 
This dude is one you never want to mess with. And he reveals why during his interview. Basically, Jose was a hitman for a drug cartel. He admitted to killing three dozen people as a hitman and dozens of others just on his own. Many of whom were people that just pissed him off. For example, in this interview, he talks about one of his brother in law's friends. Whenever the friend would visit, he would tell him to park on the side of the road, not on his driveway. He told him this a number of times, yet he still continued to park on the driveway. So, what did he do? He asked the guy to take him for a ride in his truck. He then shot him just to teach him a lesson. I told him, Didn't I tell you not to park on my driveway? And he said he didn't listen to nobody except his mother. Okay. okay. Moving on to number seven, we have Charles Manson. Charles Manson was an infamous cult leader who got his followers to carry out a number of murders in the late 1960s. Manson is probably best known for the killing of the actress Sharon Tate. Well, in 1988, he did an interview and people were terribly freaked out by it. In the interview, he is talking gibberish. Half the stuff he says just doesn't make sense. Interviewer Geraldo Rivera tries to understand what Charles is going on about. At one point, Charles just gets so mad at him and starts yelling at him. No, 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 no. you hey, who else knows what else you do? Well, I said, you haven't seen the bloody trail yet. <laughs> you haven't seen the bloody trail yet. What do you mean? Oh, it's been worse than that. You think, oh, the nine was just the first little, little marbles in the bucket. There's a whole row of people out there that's been getting killed. At another point, he says, all you want to do is sell death, blood, and fear. So, that's creepy. And then at another point, he just gets up and starts doing this weird dance. Yeah, I make the loss from here. Which according to a number of sources, he did this in a number of interviews randomly. He did this to avoid a prison, so people would be like, oh, he's not in the right set of mind, he needs to be placed elsewhere. Moving on to number six, we have Otis Tool. Otis Tool, or the Jacksonville Cannibal, is a serial killer convicted of six counts of murder. He's most famous for killing the son of American's most wanted host, John Walsh. In an interview from 1993, we see how dark and twisted Tool really is. He would talk about his dark desires, like watching an entire city burn. He then went on to justify his killings, saying that taking someone's life is no different than stepping on a bug or eating animal meat. There's way more disturbing stuff that he discusses, but it's just too much to talk about on YouTube. Like he goes into depth about his killings. It's way too much to hear. We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with Joel Rifkin. Tragedy happens in lives. Unfortunately, it was their lives. Certain instances. The world wouldn't know his name until after his killing spree had ended. Now, in a rare prison interview, serial killer Joel Rifkin talks about his sickening crimes down to the smallest detail. Joel Rifkin was an American serial killer responsible for taking the lives of 17 women in the 1990s. He was caught in 1993 when cops pulled him over for a missing license plate. But to their horrors, they found his latest victim in his trunk. He was then sentenced to 203 years in prison. In this interview, Joel just seems so proud of himself when he's recalling his crimes. He also talks about the police's interrogation process and why he confessed to the crimes. The most disturbing thing though is when he admits to keeping trophies from each of his victims. He said he did this so that he could remember each victim and what he did to them. As the numbers started to increase, an ID would, you know, okay, that has a photo, I know, I know who that girl was, uh, or a piece of jewelry, okay, I know that it's from that girl. In our fourth spot, we have Israel Keys. Israel Keys started his killings in 1996 and continued on until March of 2012 when he was finally arrested. He was known for traveling to a number of locations to commit his crimes. Then he would rob banks and homes so that he could afford to travel to kill. In this interview, we see him talk about his killings and how he selected his victims. When I was smart, I would let them come to me. Just remote area. People just found it gross how calmly he talks about this all while eating a bagel and drinking. 
He continued on saying what his strategy was, and that was to grab people in remote locations like parks and campgrounds, even cemeteries. You might not get exactly what you're looking for. There's not as much to choose from in a manner of speaking, but there's also no witnesses really. There's nobody else around. In our third spot, we have Chris Watts. If you've seen the Netflix documentary on Chris Watts and his family, then you know how messed up this whole story is. Chris is guilty of killing his wife and their two daughters. When he was brought into questioning, he denied having anything to do with this. But after failing the polygraph test, the police started nailing him hard. That's when he came up with this elaborate lie about what happened. It's crazy seeing him put on this whole show and turning his wife into a criminal, saying she was the one that hurt their daughters and then he hurt her as a result. She hurt him. In the end, the officers saw right through his fabricated story. But still, it's crazy. Moving on to number two, we have Richard Kuklinski. I could get over on you or get you to do what I wanted you to do is to hurt your family. Richard started killing at a very young age. He committed his first murder when he was just 13 years old. Over the span of his career, he took the lives of around 200 people. Could even be more. I mean, he would often kill homeless people just for fun. On top of that, he worked as a hitman for the mafia. So yeah, his count is pretty high. It was revealed that any person who was ever deemed his friend was eventually killed off by him. In 1988, he was caught by an undercover cop and sent to prison. In this interview, it is truly disturbing to see the lack of remorse he has. Listen to him talk about him shooting a guy. And I went pop, pop, pop. And I went pop, pop. And I can see the material moving on his, uh, on his jacket as these things. Actually, they made little marks on it. They, on the jacket, I guess they were burn marks. I think the scariest part was all of a sudden during the interview, he gets this messed up smile on his face and just stares at the interviewer for an uncomfortable amount of time. I legit got uncomfortable for the interviewer. And then after that long, unbearable pause, he starts asking the interviewer questions. Hmm. <laughs> What do you think about me? Anything good, bad, or indifferent? It just made me cringe. It's so bad. And in our number one spot, we have Zachary Davis. This interview gave me the chills. It makes me so uncomfortable. So this is the interview of Zachary Davis. In August of 2012, he took his mother's life before trying to set his house on fire with his brother inside. Now, Zachary has been diagnosed with a number of mental illnesses, including schizophrenia and depressive disorder. In 2007, when he was nine years old, his father passed away from ALS, and that apparently started this all. He just spiraled out of control and became withdrawn. He even had an app on his phone about serial killers, and in his notebooks, he would write about disturbing things, like you can't can't spell slaughter without laughter. The creepiest part of this interview is when Dr. Phil asks him about the murder weapon, which was a sledgehammer. At one point while discussing it, he literally smiles as if he's proud of what he did. That sent shivers down my spine. It is terrifying. All right guys, that's all for today's video. Let's move quickly along to our comment shout out portion. I'll be shouting out comments from the video, top 10 dark things the Vikings did. Stephen Curry commented, shower thought. When reading, you're looking at a dead tree and hallucinating. You gotta specify that you're talking about like reading a book because I'm reading a teleprompter right now and that doesn't make sense. 
But technically, you're looking at a dead tree in Hala- Yeah, I guess, I guess, I guess. Callan Animations commented, I've been waiting for you guys to do something like this. Anyways, love your videos. Aw, oh, thanks so much. Love you. Don't know who you are, but we'll go with it. Vicky Heron commented, I feel like Lindsay is so good that she could be a motivational speaker. Okay, I'll become a motivational speaker. Like, about what though? Stay in school. When life gets you down, pick yourself back up. I don't know why I went into that voice, but hey, if this doesn't work out, catch me at your school presentations. <laughs> all right guys, that's all the comments I'm shouting out for today's video. Make sure to comment something down below for a chance to be featured in my next comment shout out. And as always, don't forget to give this video a big thumbs up and subscribe to Most Amazing Top 10 for more amazing videos. I've been your host, Lindsay Ivan, and I'll see you when I see ya.